So to introduce our last but not least speaker today, this is uh, Roman Gabriel Olar, Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science at Trinity College Dublin as well, received his PhD in Political Science from Essex and is also a research fellow at the Michael Nicholson Center for Conflict and Cooperation at the University of Essex. His research focuses on the polit politics of authoritarian regimes, state repression, civil military relations and democratization. And he has also published in comparative political studies as well as research in politics and the Journal of Peace Research. So I very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks everyone for being here. Hopefully you can see, see my screen. And today I'm going to talk about um, a debate that has been quite prevalent since the beginning of the, um, of the pandemic and what, or more precisely, what did the quarantine mean for, for democratic politics, right? Because as Devni said in the beginning, while all the countries were exposed to the same kind of stimulus or to the same uh, to the same event and have taken very similar measures, those things mean very different things for for the different countries. And what those measures mean for the country very much depends on their institutional uh, institutional uh, makeup. So <clears throat> I'm going to focus on this distinction between democracy and autocracy and try to look at how. Uh, these uh, democracy and autocracies responded to the to the pandemic, although it doesn't necessarily mean that they have they are more efficient. And also, I'm going to try to discuss towards the end what are the implications of democratic uh, for democratic governance. But the quarantine meant that all the countries imposed uh, high levels of restrictions on their civic spaces, on their societies, maybe. Uh, more so democracies impose these restrictions, something that a lot of uh, citizens living in democratic uh, societies have never experienced or never expected. But also the imposition of these restrictions was perceived and there was a lot of discussion in, in mass media that a lot of uh, um, political leaders have used the quarantine as a mean to uh, consolidate or keep political power. So probably the most mentioned example is the one of Viktor Orban in, in Hungary that used the, the law of um, uh, emergency laws and gave him power to enact through decrees on, for unlimited time, but also other regimes such as uh, Duterte in the, in the Philippines uh, has relied on emergency laws and most other countries in the world has, have, have relied on, um, on emergency laws to, to enforce the, the quarantine. Uh, and also, this was, in certain cases, was used as a blanket approach to also eliminate opposition, not so much in terms of enforcing the quarantine, but also certain leaders were able to imprison uh, the opposition or their critics for criticizing the approach of the, of the regime uh, in handling the, the pandemic. And I'm going to situate my, my talk in this debate in the political economy literature that takes, as you would expect, two very different uh, takes. So the early political uh, economy literature says that, well, autocracies are better managers of crisis, and they draw these insights from the, from the literature on the differences in between democracy and autocracy on economic development, right? And they say that, well, democracies are better able to manage a crisis because they don't have as much accountability and they can take measures that might be unpopular with, with the public, but these measures could also be very efficient or in theory could achieve the objectives that they have, uh, they have in mind. And in this case, for, for handling a pandemic and forcing people to stay indoors might be a very unpopular, unpopular uh, policy, but also might achieve the, the objective of flattening the curve by interrupting the transmission chain of the, of the virus, right? And part of this, of this idea is also how China uh, presented these efforts and engaged in this propaganda saying that China was the, in the best position to, to take effective measures simply because it doesn't have to respond to its own citizens. But the alternative um, view on uh, how to handle crises and how to handle policymaking in general comes from the developmental literature that says that, well, uh, 
generally uh, democracies perform better in dealing with uh, with crises because they have because they have more accountability, they bring more input from different uh, from different group into policy making, and also by bringing input from different groups, they also <clears throat> uh, have better compliance from all the actors in the society that accept the necessary measures to deal with the effects of uh, of a crisis. And historically, it has been uh, true that actually democracies tend to perform autocracies when it comes to reducing deaths from, from epidemics. So um, a few months ago, the, the economist, when was right in the beginning of, this, of the pa pandemic, showed uh, the results of an analysis that shows that historically, uh, the death rates from epidemics, whether it's the SARS, the Ebola outbreak, or some other type of health, healthcare crisis, Tend, the death rate tended to be higher in, in non-democracies versus, uh, versus uh, democracies. But then when we look at the COVID cases, what we observe, we observe that there is actually a non-linear relationship between, uh, between the number of cases and the, um, the level of democracy. So here on the, on the y-axis, on the left-hand side, you see the natural log of cases per million of, uh, of inhabitants. And down here, you can see the VDEM electoral uh, democracy index. And, and we see there's a curvy linear relationship between, between the number of confirmed cases and democracies. And given that we know that autocracies were more likely in the first instance to uh, suppress information and to under-report the, the number of actual cases, and there's a good likelihood that the number of cases is much higher in, uh, low, at lower levels of, uh, of democracy. And also before moving forward, the, I want to say that the usual caveat applies to, to this data in the sense that this is very preliminary data and it's also very, very noisy data. But to, to, uh, to what we have, this is the best data we have on the confirmed uh, cases. And when we look at the, at the deaths, we see a similar relationship with uh, higher levels of deaths at um, lower levels of democracy and at high levels of democracies and uh, lower levels in between. But once again, because the, the number of deaths are most likely underreported in autocracy, it could very well be that again, the number of deaths in the, in the case of lower, at lower levels of democracy might be, might be higher. But when it comes to the restrictions that countries have imposed, um, what we see, we see a bit of a different approach or a different, um, a very different um, <clears throat> pattern in terms of democracies and autocracy. So I relied on um, Oxford uh, data collection on uh, countries' policies as they relate to, to COVID-19 to look into the extent to which uh, democracies and autocracies have imposed restrictions when it comes to school closures, when it comes to canceling public gathering and events, imposing uh, stay-at-home orders, or even restricting freedom of movement, both internally and, and internationally. And what do we observe in this graph? We observe that democracies on average impose uh, higher levels of restrictions or their index of restriction was much higher compared to, to autocracies. And on an index from zero to 100, the difference is about of three points and the difference between autocracies and democracies is statistically significant. So the t-test shows that the level of restrictions, it's much higher and in democracies and uh, this is statistically significant. Also, when we look at whether and how these regimes have offered economic support, we see once again that democracies have outperformed autocracies being uh, much quicker and offering higher levels of support in terms of income support and debt relief both for individuals and for um, and for um, for businesses and we see that this difference is it's huge it's about 23 points on average 
and again it stays statistically significant throughout these this whole period so we see that democracies in a way perform as we would expect in this case in the sense that they are more likely to respond to the economic needs of of their of their citizen but when of their citizens and this graph is really interesting because this graph uh, tries to um, show the extent to which the application of restrictions and uh, and offering uh, economic support has moved in in tandem and, and we see that while democracies were much quicker and imposed high levels of restrictions also they try to keep up with the level of economic support they they have offered and although they were a bit slower than with the restrictions they still tried if the two follow a very similar trend on the contrast uh, autocracies, as one would expect, imposed the restrictions but were much slower and had overall lower levels of economic support. So one again, once again, showing or offering some type of evidence that uh, autocracies are less, are less likely to be responsive to the needs of their citizens, but then they are quick to use any kind of restrictions uh, deem necessary to achieve their uh, their political uh, political objectives. When it comes to health policies, or when it comes to policies that are being applied directly to uh, contact tracing, to to policies, right? We see that um, um, there. Although the graph shows that initially there's a huge difference between autocracies and democracy, something that is most likely driven by China and by its neighbors having experienced the effect of COVID-19 pandemic much quicker. After the, uh, the number of cases started increasing in the rest of the world, this difference between democracies and autocracy in terms of their health policy or their contact, contact tracing and their testing policies uh, stops being statistically significant. There seems to be no, no difference between, between the two. However, the important caveat here is that uh, the devil is in the details in the sense that this data only captures the extent to which these policies exist, but it does not capture how efficient these policies were, right? So in this case, what we see, we see that both democracies and autocracies were equally likely to declare that they have implemented policies in terms of uh, public information campaign, in terms of testing, in terms of contact tracing, right? But the extent to which their uh, policies were efficient, it's a lot harder to gauge because we don't have access to the data to which they were actually able, they were actually implementing their contact tracing on their on their or their testing uh, testing policies. And that in a way bears the question on have democracies done better or were democracies better equipped to deal with this, uh, with this pandemic? And on the first instance, there seems to be that democracy seems to have taken the so-called more socially desirable policies in terms of dealing with the pandemic. And if we look at the number of deaths, if that, is, if that is any indicator of success, on average so far, democracies seems, seem to have done better in reducing the number of, of deaths. But at the same time, this is still an ongoing uh, situation and it's still a bit too early to draw any strong and powerful conclusion about it. But more importantly, it's what is going to happen next, right? So what can the existing research and can, what can we tell about the expectations that these restrictions are going to be reversed by, uh, by regimes and what is going to make them more or less, or less, less likely. So there are a few insights that we can draw from the literature on comparative uh, autocracy and comparative uh, democracy. So first of all, uh, very much on whether the of other countries are going to revert to pre-COVID-19 levels of democracy or freedom of association and social political rights is going to depend on the strength of the opposition pre-pandemic pre and the extent to which the civil society is going to be able to 
uh, mobilize in requesting their rights and being able to pressure the governments to re to reverse these these restrictions right and this is very important because during the pandemic is going is it was hard to protest and we've seen a very big reduction in the extent to which protests have have happened uh have happened out in the streets. Of course, again, the caveat applies to the to the recent three weeks where we've seen an increase in the number of protests. But up to that point, last year, 2019 was a year with uh, the widest wave of nonviolent protests around the world. And there were protests in, in a lot of different places such as Chile, Bolivia, Hong Kong, uh, Sudan, and so on and so forth. We've seen a huge global wave of nonviolent protest against authoritarianism that was curbed by the onset of the pandemic and that forced members of the civil society to move indoors and to be and increase their uh, the difficulties they've had they've had in uh, continuing their struggle against uh, against these uh, restrictions of uh, political participation. And whether that is because they fear the virus and fear infections, whether it's harder to overcome the, the restriction imposed by their regimes, uh, ultimately it's going to matter for what we observe in the, on the long-term development of, uh, of, the, of democratic uh, governance. And at the same time, uh, another um, factor that is uh, likely to matter in terms of whether we are going to see some reversal of these restrictions is the extent to which countries are going to exert external pressure on their neighbors or on their allies to try to, to improve their, uh, their levels of democratic participation and social, political, uh, and economic, economic rights, right? So, for example, uh, the European Union has been quite critical of the uh, of, of Hungary's use of emergency law, and as soon as the uh, Hungarian Parliament adopted the uh, the law that gave Orbán unlimited power, there was a quick wave of criticism uh, directed towards towards Hungary. Right, but. In comparative, if some if other countries such as the Philippines, for instance, that's in it's in a less democratic neighborhood and doesn't have as many external uh, connection with these neighbors that are also tend to be less democratic, there is going to be a lower likelihood for the Philippines, for example, to receive external pressure to improve its on its restrictions or to improve on its uh, overall levels of of democracy. But at the same time, this is not all good news or the fact that uh, the, uh, that autocracies were able to impose re these restrictions doesn't mean it's all good news for them. For some, in some cases, um, autocrats or would-be aut autocrats had to postpone elections that they had in the bag, for instance. So in the case of Russia, the referendum that allows um, Putin to uh, it allows Putin to run for two, another two six-year terms had to be postponed because of the pandemic, right? And the concern uh, that was expressed to a certain extent, but it's hard to understand exactly because they, there is some incentive to misrepresent the true intention was that if the Russian bureaucracy does a very bad job in being able to, to deal with the effects of the pandemic, that is going to show a, a regime vulnerability. And the same discussion happened in Poland uh, that uh, had to postpone its presidential election because the, the party that is currently in power uh, was afraid that their ability or if they fail to deal with, with the pandemic is going to reflect, is going to show their their weakness of, of the regime, and that is going to cause them on the long term in the, in the election. And similarly for, for Bolivia, which ha already had a very contentious election last year, and that uh, was supposed to rerun that election, they had to postpone that election they, that already has the country uh, split uh, in half in terms of who, is the, who was the rightful winner of the previous election and what is going to happen next. So the fact that a lot of these countries had to postpone elections because of the pandemic and that they might not be as efficient in dealing with the effects of the pandemic 
might in a way strip their regime naked or in other words is going to show their weakness and is going to show the lack of state capacity and their bureaucratic incompetence to the citizens and if even if the citizens might not have full political uh, participation if they have enough mechanism that might create pressure for mobilization against the regime and whether the regimes are going to be punished in uh, in elections or whether they are going to re, uh, citizens are going to mobilize they are going to demand for demand for political change so there is some indication that there is going to these uh, regimes inabilities to deal with with the pandemic might create pressures for mobilization and ultimately if there's enough demand for political change, we might see some uh, autocracies collapse. And actually we might see in some cases, increases in the levels of democracies rather than, uh, rather than these restrictions being uh, irreversible and being long, long term. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for very interesting presentations. 